Today on Locked On Canadians, Shea Weber has been traded to the Vegas Golden Knights. We will be talking about that and we will be answering some mailback questions, but we will be primarily focusing on what Shea Weber meant to this market and what this market will miss about him. That's all coming up in one moment on Locked On Canadians. For Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to episode 639 of Locked On Canadians. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on YouTube. Five days a week, we will be talking about the Montreal Canadiens. And there's big news today, and a lot of our commenters are going to be very gratified because they turned out to be right. And I will admit, I was wrong. I did think it was going to be a lot harder to trade Shea Weber's contract. It turns out that Kent Hughes is a wizard. And here to talk about that is, first of all, me. I'm one of your hosts. My name is Laura Sab, also known as The Active Stick. And I'm joined, as always, by my wonderful co-host, Scott Matla, who covers the rocket for Habs Eyes on the Prize, but also has all manner of Habs feelings, just like I do. And Scott, it is a sweltering, disgusting day in Montreal. Is it the same over in Buffalo? I I woke up this morning on the couch keeping an eye on the dog because she's had some stomach trouble the past couple of days. I rolled over at 6.45 in the morning, looked at my phone, and it said, good morning, it is 80 degrees outside. And I went, absolutely not. And then I have proceeded to sweat from that time until now, even when I'm not doing anything like recording a podcast. It is not good for us chubby fellas out there today. Um, Godspeed to everyone else. Uh Hydrate, mix in a water. That's important. And I was sitting down. I was going to go grab a drink and some dinner with a buddy of mine who works for a local brewery in Rochester. We hadn't seen each other in a little bit. Sitting on the couch next to the dog, waiting for him to pull up uh, to the place uh, right around the corner here. And Darren Dreger tweets that something is imminent in Montreal. Uh, It is not likely to be a Jeff Petrie trade. It sounds like it might be related to Shea Weber's contract. 20 minutes later, tops. Shea Weber is a Vegas Golden Knight. I had started writing the article for Eyes on the Price so we could just get the news out. And I had plugged in Arizona Coyotes. The Canadians also sent extra pieces. They did this and they did that. And you know what? They didn't do anything. They traded Shea Weber one for one for Evgeny Dodonov of the Vegas Golden Knights. And we talked about Kent Hughes kind of finessing Joe Sackick a little bit in the last episode, and despite some people being mad about that, they got an NHL player with just this year left on his contract and shed Shea Weber's $7.8 million cap hit. That's impressive work, regardless of what you think. And uh, I'm going to actually bring up the tweets here when Laura talks for a little bit from Cat Friendly about the reasoning behind this, but... This looks like a tremendous W if you are Kent Hughes right now. I have to say every single move so far by Kent Hughes, we talked about it on the last episode. We keep talking about it every time he makes a move. And as he has been doing his offseason housekeeping slash to-do list slash whatever, I have just been more and more impressed with him. And I will say one thing, though, is that I think that one of the reasons that we thought it would be hard for the Canadians to trade Shea Weber's cap hit is that everybody knew that they needed to get him off the books because Carey Price might come back and all of that. And um, I still haven't been able to articulate a way in which the offseason using the the LTIR over the course of the offseason and that first day where they have to get back under the cap, all of that stuff. I still haven't found a good way to explain it. But this, you have it. I have cap friendly pulled up in front of me right now because there were some tweets about this and to clear up a common misconception, a team does not need to be below the upper limit to start the season on LTIR. They can use the LTIR training camp equation on the day prior to season start and place players on LTIR while already above the limit. Um, I know that doesn't super explain everything, but my thought is if I understand this properly is that the closer you are to being at the cap so getting under that is the more you can get out of the player you're putting on LTR they could put Shea Weber on there but the closer you are to the the upper limit allows you to 
uh, get the most out of LTR, that full contract space. Like if you're 4 million, you know, below it, I, as far as I understand, you put them on there, you only get so much and we'll obviously get more on that. And from cap friendly, they actually have a thing that they answered because they're probably getting a ton of questions. So why did Montreal make this trade? No club wants to use LTIR. It's restricted to roster construction. You don't get pro rating. So any recalls cost more cap space and makes an overage penalty significantly more likely in terms of those cap hits. And this enables the Canadians to likely operate without using long-term injured reserve going into the season, uh, which James Merle pointed out that with a first overall pick and a bonus laden entry level contract coming in, uh, it eliminates the potential that they might have a cap overage going into the season already. So it, it's it's a really good, smart move across the board for the Canadians here. Right. And, and Kent Hughes said a lot of really smart things. And in our next segment, we are going to talk about Shea Weber, what he meant to, to this team, what he meant to this market. But I just want to quickly note that uh, Joshua Raw and uh, Riley Kidney have been invited to the uh, Team Canada World Junior Summer Selection Camp thing. <laughs> yes, um, Summer Selection. So that's for the 2023 I believe that's 2023. Uh, that is my camp. understanding. Yeah, I'm going to pull that up because so many things have happened today that I have completely, for, like, my brain is just yeah. gone. Yeah. Um, first of all, it's hot. Second of all, I went back to the office for the first time in, like, seven years. And uh, we are very tired, and the Habs are doing lots of things. So please bear with us. We do have feelings and thoughts and opinions. But, uh, you know, we talked about how Joshua Wall was, like, the last person cut, right? He was... We called it a snub. We thought it was a snub. We thought he deserved better. Uh, we still think he deserved better, but at the same time, at least they're calling him now uh, again for oh. selection. And uh, now Riley Kidney has joined him. So that's really fun. I think, you know, with the Memorial Cup coming too, there's a lot to be excited about in the Habs prospect system. And a lot of our mailback questions have been about that. Uh, and I just want to note, because of the Shea Weber news and because we want to talk about him a little bit, we aren't going to get to all of our mailback questions that we are going to do a two-part mailback question. So our Monday episode is going to be all of the questions we didn't get to today, uh, unless more breaking news happens, in which case we're going to scramble to try and fit it all in. In the meantime, in our next segment, what did Shea Weber mean to the Montreal market and what will we miss about him? All that's coming up in just one moment. But first, Bet Online is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, news, and odds at betonline.net, including basketball, the NHL, Major League Baseball, and of course, all the latest fighting news from MMA and UFC to boxing. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and more. Head to the website today, that's betonline.net, or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. BetOnline is where the game starts. And before we get back into Shea Weber talk, we just want to remind our listeners that the Locked On listener survey is going on right now. And it's really important that you fill it out uh, because it helps shape the way you receive our content. It also helps shape what types of ads that you get from us. So that's also really, really important. So please take a look at our listener survey. You can go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey right now and get started. And you may be entered for a chance to win one of 10 $100 Ticketmaster gift cards. Don't forget to go and take our audience survey at LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. We know you have a lot of thoughts about ads and things like that, so please, please make yourself heard. All right, Scott, you and I have been accused of hating Shea Weber on this show. We have been accused of having it in for Shea Weber. We hate him. We do not. I love Shea Weber. I loved Shea Weber. Uh, we, uh, and I will fully admit that when the trade happened between, you know, it was one for one PK Subban for Shea Weber, I did not think it was a good trade simply because of Shea Weber's cap hit and age as compared to PK Subban's cap hit and age. I was a big fan of PK Subban and I was a fan of Shea Weber as a player in Nashville. I absolutely was, but it was a money and age thing that I thought that was a mistake. Obviously, when you look at it now, Shea Weber was very, very important to this market. He accomplished a lot in Montreal. It breaks my heart forever that he did not win a Stanley Cup. But I think that Shea Weber, we, we say sometimes on this on the show, like they did, he did everything that was asked of him. 
I think with Shea Weber is that he showed up here. He immediately, he he didn't need to be asked. He became a leader. He became an example. He became a defenseman. He worked his body to the bone, to the point where he has so many injuries that he can't play anymore for this market. And that's something that, you know, Scott and I will never, ever, 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 uh, you know, discount how important he is. And, and, and it's so unfair for people to think that we were down on him. We were down on his usage. And it turned out at the end, they were overusing a guy who was broken in seven different places. So I think we have to remember that that's kind of, I'm hoping that's an era that's phased out where you just play through every single injury that's hopefully getting phased out of the NHL so that these guys can have a lot more longevity in the NHL. But when he was here, he was phenomenal. Like he is, despite his age, despite his injuries, he played like the Shea Weber game. I I look at the Shea Weber era in Montreal through two different things in that the trade was franchise defining is that it allowed Nashville to enter a cup window for most of a decade and, you know, come close, but not beat Pittsburgh P.K. Subban was phenomenal there, and then his body began to fail him because of, you know, his style of play and neck injuries and uh, back injuries, whatever it might be, and that hampered him a little bit. And Weber was Shea Weber. Not always the flashiest guy. We know we can shoot the puck. We know he's physical. He was never very fleet of foot, but he did everything that he could to, you know, get the team where it needed to be. And unfortunately, he suffered some serious injuries with his playing style, and he gritted through that. Yes, we were accused of hating Shea Weber. We were not fans of how he was used because the Canadians were constructed in such a way that Shea Weber was the only one really eating these heavy minutes, and no one else really was allowed to or didn't because of the coaching staff and whatnot. And the whole thing came down to just a mindset around the team that felt like a step backwards with uh, the Canadians have all these young pieces. You have guys like Max Pacioretty and Alexander Radulov when he was here. You had Andre Markov, who was still very useful at that time. You had Alex Galchenyuk and Brendan Gallagher. And then everything kind of went back into, we're going to play gritty kind of shut down hockey. And that's not what the team needed. And it's weird because the team had some bad years. But under Shea Weber's, you know, tenure as captain, they made the Stanley Cup final. They went on that run. They upset Pittsburgh and almost beat Philadelphia in the first round of that first COVID playoff. But they never had sustained success. It was always these blips here and there. And that's not on Weber. Weber's tenure in Montreal is a time of wasted opportunity in a lot of different ways. Like, luckily, Kent Hughes appears to kind of have them on the right track now with what they need to be doing. And the rebuilding and getting these young pieces in and building that way. It was a it was a very big theme at Rocket Locker Cleanup today is they expect the team to be younger next year. And I think coaches and players know that. Weber's time here was a last hurrah for a lot of guys, Carey Price likely included. And they weren't able to get that done. And that's not the fault always of the players. It's roster and whatnot. And he didn't win a Stanley Cup. And that that stings for a guy who, you know, He's been God in the league since what, 2003 at this point? It's 19 years. And the way he played and everything is the fact that he made it that long is like truly impressive. And I, we didn't touch on this so much in the first segment, but the fact that he was able to be traded without giving anything up is incredible work from Kent Hughes. And here's the thing is that hits off our book now. We can stop worrying about cap recaptures and this and that. Uh, I wish they could have gotten, you know, another trophy for Weber. Yeah, they got the Western Conference title last year, but him not getting to lift that Stanley Cup and hand it to Carey Price, that hurts a little bit. Yeah, they won Olympic gold together in that, but him not being able to hand the cup off to someone I'm sure he's good friends with off the ice too, that hurts a little bit inside. And it wasn't always the best relationship, but man, it's it sucks, to be honest. Like... Now we get to do a summer of captain speculation. I can't wait for that. But uh, (laughs) I'm very intrigued to see what's next now for the Canadians with this off the books. And some of our questions have actually been captain themed now that Shea Weber has been traded. Uh, The Caden Gooley mention of the day will be that he uh, told, I believe it was TSN, if I'm not mistaken, that he's proud 
to get compared to Shea Weber. And I think that's good in one respect in that Shea Weber has had such an influence on players that play that physical defensive game. But I want to caution against, you know, us believing that he is going to be the next Shea Weber because Shea Weber, Shea Weber, Caden Gooley is Caden Gooley. And as a, as excited as we are about him, I feel like those expectations that we set on him, I know they kind of look alike. <laughs> you know, I know there's a lot of that aspect as well. I'm very excited to see what Caden Gooley brings. I think what I think I think the way that I would describe Caden Gooley is if you took a player that you wanted to be like Shea Weber but you brought him up in a more modern hockey uh, philosophy way or more modern hockey point of view. Uh, I think that's what you would get with Caden Gooley. But uh, for Shea Weber, honestly, like I think everybody in this market should be thankful for, for him. I think towards the end, there are a lot of question marks and, and some, some, some snark that shouldn't have been thrown his way, some criticism that maybe you know, shouldn't have had anything to do with him. But I think that he, you know, he led the team by example. And all of them say only good things about him. They talk about how inspirationally inspirational he is, what a great leader he is, you know, how quiet and just calming and unassuming he is. I think, I think he had a good influence on the young players that were lucky enough to play with him. And I wish him the best. I really do hope that maybe he gets to win the cup as an executive or coach someday. That's that's something that I'd like to see. Um, you know, and uh, again, I I just I I never had anything against Shea Weber. The person I had a lot against the coaches that used Shea Weber, the um, the extremely broken person uh, for too many minutes on the ice. Uh, I just I think that's it. I hope he gets a little bit of just peace and quiet. Now, obviously Montreal is a very noisy market in terms of like hockey fandom and Shea Weber seems like a very reserved person. And I kind of hope this allows him to kind of, you know, have his peace and quiet. Yeah. He's probably got to check in with Vegas for the one thing I will be mad about with this is that he had to routinely come to Montreal to be checked out by doctors to make sure that he was actually too broken to play. If he gets traded, if when this trade is uh, all finalized and whatnot's going on, which I believe it is, if he gets to Vegas and all that stops, I'm just going to kind of put my hands up and go, why was it only in Montreal that this was a problem? But that's that's me arguing with not with things that um, might not be happening right now. So um, I hope he gets his peace and quiet. I hope he gets to, you know, go out on his own terms right out those last four years and then retire. Um, and yeah, that's that's us closing the book on the Shea Weber era. We're going to have some more on Evgeny Dodonov once we do a little bit of research going into next week. But that's, uh, we wanted to talk about, you know, the guy who was actually on our team. So uh, this is a farewell to the man mountain in Montreal. And uh, well, it's time to start a new chapter in this book of the Canadians history then, because this one is closed. So I'm very, it it's going to be, a, it's going to be a fun ride. The Shane Wright era begins in three weeks. <laughs> the whoever they pick first era uh just a quick note though like you know this is our goodbye to him but i know that shea weber is much beloved by this fan base so if you have good things to say if you have nice memories if you have anything to say please send us your comments you can leave them in the youtube uh you can email them to us at locked on canadians at gmail.com you can also tweet them at lo underscore canadians just you know just remember he gave it his all. He gave he gave this market his all. He gave this team his all until he literally physically couldn't anymore. All right. It is time for part one of our mailbag that might end up being three parts. I don't know. You've got you you sent us so many questions, and that's all coming up in just one moment. All right, Scott, are you ready? Let's do the first batch of questions. And for everybody listening, the mailbag is usually a Friday only episode, but sometimes we get so many questions that we have it spill over into the Monday episode. That's what's going to happen unless huge news happens, in which case your questions will get answered maybe on Tuesday. Uh, we're going to jump right into this. The first one comes from Randy Hansen. Who do you think will be the next coaching hire by Montreal? Could Blacanitz or Markov return in a coaching or development capacity? I think, you know what, I think that they might call Markov back. I don't know if they will, but it just feels right to me. Uh, they I, Markov is my bet too, but also he was suspended in Russia with his coaching uh, thing revoked. So, like, I'm not 100% sure what the status of that is. Um, they did say they're not bringing him back for his 10 games or anything like that, which is the right call at this point. But 
I'd like to see Markov. I don't know if Placanitz would because I think Thomas Placanitz is kind of enjoying the life he has back in the Czech Republic with uh, his wife and kids. And I don't know. There's something very funny about Thomas Placanitz potentially coaching people considering his sense of humor and very like direct way of handling things that I don't know if it would mesh well with everybody because I can imagine him walking up to Nick Suzuki and being like, that's my number. And, you know. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera after that. Um, also from Randy, the next Hab to get traded has to be Druen, doesn't it? I think I think it's going to be Josh Anderson. He's he's the guy that uh, people are calling about. And Kent Hughes was very smart in talking to Pierre Lebrun because he gave him the play-by-play, the breakdown of how Lekkonen was traded. And he made it clear that if you want a guy... And I say, no, it's not necessarily a no. It's give me a better offer until I get what I want. So I think the fact that there's so much smoke about there being interest in Josh Anderson, and I understand why. And obviously we will be sad to see him go because he's just so fun to watch. He's just hilarious. Uh, it's, I, I, lo- I, love, I love Josh Anderson. I don't have to say it. Our listeners already know it. I love Josh Anderson a lot. But right now is probably when his value is going to be highest. And right now is when GMs are calling. So it's entirely possible that Josh Anderson is going to be the next person to be traded. I will be sad. Uh, My thought is uh, when they select Shane Wright, Christian Dvorak will be the next player traded just because they will get another center behind there. Uh, They might run with Jake Evans. They might run with someone else, but I think that Christian Dvorak might be the next surprise piece out of here that gets the Canadians back into round one or moves them up in round one to select somebody else. Uh, from Paul Brand Show, Torts to Philly is going to end badly, won't it? What's the over-under on games coached before he's fired? Okay, so here's my thing on John Tortorella, right? I think that his coaching style is a thing of the past. I think that he has a shelf life with every team that he coaches, He has a style that I think a lot of people see as bullying, and I don't necessarily condone that. I do think, though, that, and and this is something that, um, you know, our friend Jay at Locked On Blue Jackets has mentioned, is that, you know, like, it wasn't, it wasn't a circus when he was in Columbus. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't every day a new controversy or anything like that. Like he was given a team that was very much a Tortorella style team and he brought the best out of them for a while. In fact, they let's not forget that they upset and upset, not just the Tampa Bay lightning, but also the Toronto Maple Leafs. Cause it's always about the Leafs. You like, <laughs> like Torts is a guy that has a shelf life right now. Is he the right person for Philadelphia? I don't think he should be coaching to be honest. I really don't. I think that he needs to evolve before he coaches again in the NHL. I just, that's, that's my opinion is that if you're an old school coach, the game is leaving you behind. So it's not a good idea for any team that's trying to rebuild or aggressively retool as Rachel from Lockdown Flyers put it. I just, I don't think it's a good idea, but here's the thing. I think that he's very much a Philly sports fan type guy. And so he's going to last at least a season, probably two. My thought with John Tortorella is that I think he's going to get, you know, the Flyers back on track quickly because they're not as bad as they shouldn't be as bad as they were this season. And they're not perfect. They're far from perfect. And I know I'm saying that as a Canadians fan. So irony is dead, but I think he's going to get a lot out of them. And then, like you said, they hit that kind of point where it doesn't work anymore. And then it wears off. And that's usually two and a half, three years, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on, how good the goalie is. I can't wait just because it's torts and it's the Philly media and it's the Philly fan base. That's oil and gasoline with a match thrown in. And I can't wait. Uh, Beth from the happy hour. Do you think Batman will retire one day or does he plan to make this a lifetime appointment? I think that he is going to, I don't know if anyone here watches uh, made for love, but it is a, uh, it's a great show and it's canceled. I know it got canceled. Uh, It's very sad. But anyway, the whole idea is that you can upload your consciousness into another body. um, And I think that's what Bettman will do. So he will continue to be the commissioner of the league long after he's gone. Please no. Like, and the thing is, everyone's (laughs) like, are they going to do an actual search? Are they going to say they're doing an actual search and just promote Bill Daly? In which case, nothing will change and nothing gets better. They did say that this offseason, their goal is to 
you prepare a plan of succession. Like he's the friggin' queen of England or something like that. Like there's a code word when Gary Batman dies or retires that they're going to go and do all this stuff. London I, Bridge has fallen or something like yeah, that. Yeah, London Bridge is down is the queen has died. And like, I, I am very ready for someone new to be at the head of the NHL. Um, But, you know, we'll see. Uh, another question from Paul Brancho. When will I stop feeling stop feeling dirty rooting for the Avalanche? I'm hoping Lekkonen gets a cup, but to me, they're still the Nordiques, and it feels wrong hoping they succeed. But Tampa beat the Habs last year and must be stopped. I think this is a, a thing that a lot of Canadians fans I've seen have been rooting with no shame or guilt for the Avalanche uh, because they are playing Tampa Bay. And they're forgetting that whole thing with the Nordiques. But I also think that... I mean, I don't want Tampa to win another cup. I, I I'm I get so it. torn. I just I get it. I, I'm torn because like you have the Pat Maroon blessing in which he's won three straight, going for four straight, and you have the Corey Perry curse in which he's lost the last two and is in this one. And I I don't know because I want the Avalanche to win because that's how you build a successful franchise. They didn't give up on young guys who might have been struggling. They didn't give up on veterans who, you know, might have been miscast in other places. They did their due diligence and they rebuilt the right way. They were terrible. Like five years ago, they were historically bad. And now they're in the Stanley Cup final. It's a blueprint for how a team should be run. And Tampa is the same way. This should be a learning experience for Canadians fans or and any team who's rebuilding. This is the way to do that. And I'm I'm really not fussed one way or the other. We either get to see our three-peat, something we haven't seen since, what, the 80s, 70s, if that. Or we see, you know, Colorado, a team that built its team the right way, get a Stanley Cup. They're first in 20-something years, I'm pretty sure. Like, there's no downside to it for me. I'm not tied to the Nordiques uh, rivalry because I'm a younger fan when the, and mostly the Nordiques didn't exist when I got into hockey, so... And I want Lekkonen to win. Like, you know, it is what it is. Um, Jeff the Red, which NHL player is most like Shorzy and which Habs player is he? That's all yours. So it's it's Brad Marchand because Brad Marchand doesn't shut up at any point in time. Brad Marchand is just Shorzy if he was from Atlantic Canada, basically. Like... On the Habs, I don't want to say Brendan Gallagher because he kind of gets bullied a little bit too much. But, like, I could see, like, Joel Edmondson playing that role, I'm pretty sure. Like, I, I want to say that. Yeah, just yapping. Just Michael Pizzetta. I'm sure Pizzetta doesn't Ooh, shut up a lot, that's too. That's a good one. <gasps> that's a good one. Uh, also from Jeff the Red, let's say Gallagher, Suzuki, and Edmondson are the top three candidates for the C. What would you put as the odds for each, and have they changed since the end of the season? Is there a dark horse candidate outside of those three? I don't think they've changed out. Uh, 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 they've changed with the end of the season. Here's what I will say: at the end of last season, I would have bet on Gallagher 100. Uh, at the end of this season, I think Nick Suzuki and Joel Edmondson have completely edged him out. And I think that the odds are still in Nick Suzuki's favor. I think he's carrying himself the way that a guy who can be captain carries himself. And that's not to say that Edmondson doesn't, but I feel like Edmondson is more like in the room captain and Nick Suzuki is more in the room on the ice and then in the city captain. Yeah. I, I, I look at Nick Suzuki in the amount that he's been featured and everything that he's saying and he is he is the guy for me right now. There's too much going on that it makes too much sense for him to not be that guy. Joel Edmondson, I think, is a very good A on this team. He's a very good leader in that regard. Uh, Gallagher, I think, is going to wear that A, too. He's going to wear it with pride, and I don't have an issue with that. So uh, outside of that, it was Josh Anderson was the only other piece, and he's in trade talks right now, so we don't really know where he's at in that. Uh, also from Jeff, what are your top three objectives for draft weekend? Get Don't a... do COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is it us or Kent Hughes? Uh, I, I, it says us. It says, what are your, so I assume our us as yeah, a Yeah, mine as is a don't get COVID. Uh, mine is definitely don't get COVID. Uh, it's also to try and see people in a safe manner that I haven't been able to see since a very long time ago, since before the pandemic with lots of hockey friends, hockey media. Um, and... 
I think for me, I, I would like to interview some players. So we're hoping to cover the draft. We've applied for that and we don't know if we will yet. They'll let us know. But if so, I'm hoping that we can bring you all some some thoughts from the players that the Canadians pick. Yes. Uh, mine is I need to go to Mapule again. I'm long overdue. It is to see friends that I haven't seen in Montreal and from across Canada in a long time. And I, I haven't really done player interviews. When I went to the Rocket playoff games, it's like I was out of practice. So I kind of hung out off to the side and just kind of listened a little bit. So I'm excited to get back into that. I'm, I'm in the same with Laura. We haven't do- divvied up how we're going to do that yet, but we'll figure it out. Uh, one more from Jeff. What are your early predictions on who will make up the Habs top six defensemen plus two extras to start next season? Uh, running it down, Petrie, Edmondson, Savard, Romanov. I'm going to put Weidman in there for now, and then I think it's going to be Harris or Gooley that starts in Montreal, and then the rest of the young guys are going to be in the AHL to start the season. Justin Barron might get a shot, um, and then Otto Leskin will be one of those potential extras as well, I think. Yeah, what Scott said. Are we done with uh, Twitter reply questions, or do we have We have more? one more. Does Weidman and Leskin in signing mean bad news for Corey Shuneman getting a new contract? And I don't I think, think so. I think the Canadians love him. I think it's more he's probably going to get a two-way deal and will probably start in the AHL next year, and that's not the worst thing in the world either. Yeah. Uh, and so those were all the questions that we got as Twitter replies. So if you sent questions as a Twitter DM on YouTube in an email – in a text, <laughs> anything like that, all of your questions will be answered on our Monday episode because we have run out of time. So in the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, you can find us on YouTube as well. And don't forget to subscribe there. You can find us on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians. You can find Scott at Scott Matley. You'll find me at The Active Stick. And once you're done listening to us, please check out Locked On NHL. And do not forget that listener survey. It's LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. Thank you so much for listening. We will talk to you on Monday.